who you are right now isn't who you need to become. I evolved so many times in different versions of James Blackwell, for example, to who I am now. A lot of inner work and uh, mindset work that you need to become. So we, we talk about creating uh, version 2.0 of who you need to become. So James Blackwell, he's been on the show before and this time we get him to share everything he teaches in his agency blueprint program that enables recruitment agency owners to scale seven figures and beyond. The first principles for consistently acquiring clients. You need to know what your niche is, so you need to define your niche. So you need to map out that market. So you need to know what is your potential client target uh, base. And you want to get that at least on a Google Sheet. So you want to have every single client that is in there that you could potentially work with. How to easily onboard and scale your business with virtual assistants. You've only got, like I said, 40, 50 units of time per week. And what you end up doing, you get distracted going the full end of the spectrum. You forget about the fundamentals of being a recruiter. How to build a team of sources based in South Africa and the system required to make this work like clockwork. We build them out in uh, South Africa and um, we've got a full service for that where we'll hire, train and manage them for you. So they're the ones that are going to connect with the candidate on LinkedIn. They're going to do all of the message follow-ups, uh, the video follow-ups, etc. Finally, the systems that you need to nail to produce 100k months consistently. So like the key thing is once you've got like the good systems in place, a good way to get clients, the sourcing, like once you've got these pieces in, then it's like the biggest shifts are going to be hiring probably two or three delivery consultants that are mm. going to be good. And so, so much more. Let's get into this week's episode. James, welcome back to the pod. Thank you for having me again. Nice to uh, do this face to face. Yeah, for the first time, I was saying uh, off uh, camera, we've known each other for quite a while now, but never met in person. So it's uh, a pleasure. Yeah. So um, obviously, you've you've got the, the Dubai colour, mate. Yeah. You don't spend sort as much of. time in the UK now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I chase the sun now. But um, yeah, I'm back in London and I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's, it's nice to just get normal weather for a change instead of just sunshine yeah. all the time. And obviously, you're here for the Recruitment Expo. So yeah. we just thought, right, yeah, let's, let's try and make the podcast happen. This is your third time on the, the podcast. So... Just to give everyone some context, what we're going to do in this conversation, which I think will be really cool, is we're going to basically break down like what people should be doing um, to go from not to 10k a month consistently at that stage, then 10k to 30k a month, and then 30k to oh, well, 40k to sort of 100k um, a month, so getting up to that seven figure stage. So I know there's you've in your business you've really broken down you've broken it down into attract, deliver, mm-hmm. systemize, scale. And there's a bunch of different things at each stage that you believe if people do effectively, it should enable them to do at what, if they're at that stage, do what they need to be doing consistently, but then also go up, go up to the different revenue points. So before, before we go into that, um, would you mind just sharing for people that don't know who you are, what you do, if you could give us that context and then let's just get straight into it. Yeah, sure. For those of you that haven't heard me before, uh, I started my own recruitment agency almost a decade ago, so 2015. Uh, before that, I was working in a S3 style recruitment agency, uh, Nigel Frank, that was very successful. Uh, worked all the way up to manager, then set up my own agency, uh, Ronald James, that is uh, in the northeast of the UK. We specialize in digital and tech recruitment, and it's still going to this day. Uh, it runs without me. I haven't been in the business for three, four years now, um, but it still generates uh, some figures here uh, without me. And then uh, I set up an education company called Agency Blueprint, uh, which is the world's leading recruitment uh, training company that helps agency owners skill, systemize and automate their business. So we basically work with agency owners that are at 10K months, wanting to scale up to 100K months, but really want to uh, do things a different way. So like building systems, automation and a virtual sourcing team. Uh, so I'm sure we'll dive into that more. And yeah, we've helped uh, just under 1,000 recruitment agencies that have been through our accelerator program now over the last uh, five years. So what we're going to do in this is break down what goes on with what you help people with, right? I, I want us to really break in into the the how. And I, I definitely agree with you with my experience with my education business, which we've recently over the last couple of months been given access to independent founders because they want more ways to upskill to actually do the job because although they have their own business, they're actually they're recruiters like they have their own business but they still have they are the mm. main they have to generate revenue they're they're recruiters right that have a business um so one thing that i've seen time and time again even in the growing agencies that we partner with one of the things that they really struggle with is the systems piece and the processes so this is why i'm really excited to delve into at each stage what you believe are the right things to be doing that can help people listening to this just get more 
out of what they're doing, become more efficient, and hopefully just have a, more of like a stressful, um, a less stressful journey, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with this not to 10K a month period. So if I'm listening to this and maybe, you know, my goal is to do 10K a month consistently, something that you referenced quite a lot on the last uh, podcast and where I wanted to start is like the first principles. Like that's something that you say a lot. Would you mind just sort of from your perspective defining first principles? Like why is that important? And then let's go through like what you believe should be the first principles at, at this stage. Sure. So from that, that startup phase, so zero to 10K, you just start in your agency. Uh, you need to know what your niche is. So you need to define your niche. So you need to map out that market. So you need to know what is your potential client uh, target uh, base. Uh, and you want to get that at least on a Google Sheet. So you want to have every single client that is in there that you could potentially work with. You want to know their email address, uh, their LinkedIn profile, URL, company page, vacancy page. So at least you know that you can market map that out. Um, you can run that in an instantly campaign to like cold email outreach, uh, LinkedIn automation campaign with Dripify to attract clients. And uh, defining your niche, so you want to make sure you can be a specialist in a niche. So some people make a mistake that they want to specialize in all of the UK, for example, or US. I believe you need to be a little bit more location specific. And ideally, I say, break it down into two or three job titles to get started. So be a real specialist, a niche within a niche. That's like... Um, for mapping out the niche, then you want to leverage yourself because you've only got you, uh, you've got maybe 40 to 50 hours of units of time per week uh, that you can be a recruiter, but you have to build a business as well. So I think most people starting up spend a lot of time on building a fancy website, a uh, brand logo, but really the, the, the crux of it is to get some live jobs on. Uh, get some candidates over the line and get some placements. So like zero to 10K is, is pretty much you've been a recruiter, but also building a business as well. So really uh, to give yourself more leverage, obviously like starting with LinkedIn automation, starting with a, a client map and then some uh, client outreach campaigns that you can do, um, whether it's video outreach, whether you're using Loom uh, to do manual one-on-one -on -one video mm -hmm. outreach or you're automating that. There's some cool tools you can do with AI video automation now, which is which, which is getting quite powerful, where we're actually working on something which I'll share maybe in a future episode. Um, but that's like zero to 10K stage. You, you're pretty much trying to get low-hanging fruit. So uh, another thing is live leads. So you want to be looking who is the clients hiring right now that you can go and try and get that job on. So everything's a little bit manual at the start. Mm. Um, and then you're trying to build out. You're not looking to systemize from day one. You're just looking to get some clients on, like some jobs on that you can work, some CVs sent, some interviews, placements. So you're still being a recruiter in, in starter phase, uh, but then you're just trying to leverage your time back by maybe building some LinkedIn automation and email automation uh, and then video outreach to try and give you a little bit of a leverage. So what I'm getting from that then, first principles at this stage are have a niche and a focus. And then also then... It's about, yeah, how can you leverage your time more, basically, is, is what I'm getting from Yeah, that. a lot of it's mindset. We cover a lot of mindset. Mm. Um, a lot of uh, recruiters that start their own business, like who you are right now isn't who you need to become. Like, mm. I evolved so many times in different versions of James Blackwell, for example, to who I am now. And uh, a lot of inner work and uh, mindset work that you need to become. So we, we talk about creating a vision 2.0 of who you need to become. So what is the goal of your business in the next five years, three years, and one year? Mm -hmm. um, so some people want a lifestyle business. So a lot of people start an agency uh, because they want more freedom. So they want more time back to spend with family, uh, friends. Uh, they want to make more freedom for financially so they can pick and choose when they work and what hours they want to work. So a lot of people start initially... Uh, for lifestyle agency, which is fine. I mean, the majority of agency owners we help, I would say 60% are lifestyle, 40% are, are want to create a, a real seven-figure agency and uh, skill it up. Um, but like, you want to make sure that you understand from first principles what it is you're looking to build mm. um, because that's going to shape what you want to do. The, the num number one mistake most people make are, is hire from day one. You can't hire until you've got some good systems and the foundations in place, mm -hmm. uh, which is like candidates, a sourcing machine, uh, an attraction machine for clients. Like you need to build these things on before you even hire your first employee. So you, you've got it down on your, when I've seen some of your videos and the things that you teach, you put at this stage, the biggest issues at this stage, getting clients consistently, more specifically like quality of jobs and clients. So mm -hmm. you can find yourself spending time on jobs that you don't get paid for, clients that mess you around, making placements consistently, and then like what you were just talking about, then like building an agency, right? So you you like to break it down into like f 
uh, four pillars, it looks like, so like which you were just mentioning a few of them. So you've got attract. Under at this stage, you need a client acquisition system, live leads, delegate, LinkedIn chat. You've then got deliver, hire first VA, work, uh, working a job 10 steps, master the close. And then, like you just said, systemize the bits you want to work towards systemizing, whilst obviously actually getting wins, generating revenue, is the LinkedIn candidate automation and client map that you're talking about. Um, and then active infantry delegation. I don't know what that means. Activity. So oh, like, sorry, activity. Um, so basically it's like every task that you do um, every hour for the week, uh, you want to account for that and then you want to start delegating. So these are the right. things you can start delegating those tasks to your VA. So probably 50, 60% of your tasks you can start to sort of outsource. Yeah. And then as you said, then you've got the scale pillar which seems a bit more like mindset focus and actually yeah. individual, which obviously is such an important factor to this. So you've, you've got boost productivity, mindset, current self to des- desired state, as you said. So on, on this stage then, what I just want us to like just delve into a bit, um, just from my experience, is why don't we first talk about like the attract piece? Because like if that's one of the main issues mm-hmm. which I agree with, is when I speak to independent founders at this stage, it is having a consistent opportunity of working with good clients that don't mess them around that pay good fees that they do placements with so you've got here client acquisition system live leads delegate linkedin chat let's let's break these down like what what's going on here then under these elements sure so to build your client um acquisition system like you, you want to look at it for, so firstly you're going to take your client market map yeah. so so that's the first thing you build is your client market map so you know every single client you could potentially work with mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's now or in the future, you've got. And then once you've got that list, uh, you can uh, start running uh, email campaigns. So like the first thing we'll start is, is email campaigns. Now, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Uh, it depends on your niche and market and what your outreach is. Email is still very strong in terms of called email outreach. It's very competitive, but it's a thing that you want to have running in the background because it gives you leverage. Once you build it once, you just don't need to touch, touch it again. Mm. You're going to get replies and you're going to get warm leads. But um, so once you start doing that, then you want to build your dream 100. So we talk about architecting a dream 100 campaign. So mm-hmm. that is like the top 100 clients that eventually you want to work with. These are clients that could give you repeat business that maybe have five or 10 roles of your uh, three job titles, for example, that you know you could work with long term. Because that strategy there is going to be different than just cold outreach to the mass market. Mm-hmm. Then you've got live leads. So live leads are going to be ones uh, which we'll touch on clear.com because mm. we're working a lot with clear.com for AI that we can just fully build this out, fully automated now where it will find the client lead, it'll find the client uh, hiring manager, it'll find the email address, it'll verify the email address, it'll uh, create a customized a personalized AI uh, email campaign with follow-up sequence, so full end-to-end. But for live leads, you want to make sure that that's low-hanging fruit. So these are clients that are hiring right now um, that are looking for uh, potentially an agency to work with them, but they're inundated. So the, it takes a little different outreach strategy than just an email, for example, because everyone knows that they're hiring. Mm. The whole idea of a cold email outreach, you're, you're going to the full market and you're looking 1% to 3% of the market is maybe looking to hire right now. So mm. let's say if you've got a list of 1,000, uh, you might have like 30 to 50 potential clients in there that potentially could work with you if you email at the right time with the right type of outreach and or then we add in video. So video outreach works really well. Um, free tool you could use is something like loom.com. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there's some really cool uh, video outreach tools now that can, once you record something once, they can AI regenerate your voice and customize your first name, the landing page and change the website, et cetera. Um, so you would do video outreach to that. Then obviously Dream 100, uh, one of the tactics that we would use would be a letter, for example. Like everyone's went remote, but uh, old school now in terms of like going back to being sent a letter with a GIF, which is normally a book, uh, which works really well with a follow-up sequence. Uh, that's where it's something we call like giftology. So like giving uh, a gift to a client and saying, look, I read this book, I thought it would be interesting for you. I really like chapter X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to follow up with you in two days on Wednesday around about two o'clock. Um, and something like that would work really well. Um, so, yeah, so you would do uh, email outreach. Uh, then you could do LinkedIn automation outreach. So once you're sending out an email, you can connect in with that hiring manager and start messaging them at the same time mm-hmm. and cross-reference the fact that you've emailed them. Letters, gifts, um, the live jobs, so like making sure that you, you're reaching out to clients that are actively hiring right now. Um, and then most of that time you can, like I said, like something with like the like of uh, Clay, you can automate a lot of this process now. Um, so that's pretty much like uh, 
some of the client acquisition, but you need to have something that's repeatable. So the email campaigns can run, the LinkedIn campaigns can run, your video outreach can run because once you've got your VA, they're the ones that, once you're recording the video, they can take it from a Google sheet into an email, into a follow-up sequence. Mm -hmm. um, let's say once you get some leads for fly back, then you want to nurture them. So some clients will not be saying yes right now, but it's all about follow-up. So like creating a nurture funnel. So we would use a tool called Streak CRM which can sit in the Gmail inbox at any maybe replies that you get, then you can do follow-ups every week. And so then you've got like, let's say you go from a list of a thousand, you get 50 maybe replies back. So from those 50, it's like nurturing them a little bit more, mm -hmm. having another customized video outreach message to them, uh, connecting them with them on LinkedIn, following up there, sending them a salary guide, sending them some value. Um, we do like events for uh, tech uh, in the tech industry, for example, inviting them to something like that, um, keeping them nurtured. So then eventually you could convert them into a client. Uh, so those are like pretty much like the, the fundamental strategies. Then you can go on top, like sp uh, sponsoring events, hosting events, uh, trying to meet clients in person is obviously the main thing. Once you generate the lead is uh, we talk around uh, the signature sales pitch deck. Mm -hmm. um, so we develop a, a custom pitch deck uh, that you have as an asset inside your agency that you can do repeatedly. Uh, so you walk in that client through their, their pain, what you know in the market, um, why you're different, your unique mechanism. So we talk about you need to create a unique mechanism of like why you deliver different to every other agency, mm -hmm. what makes it stand out. So uh, for example, we would put in a, uh, we put in something like clear AI outreach, uh, the way we nurture candidates, the way we track candidates, the way we, we focus on passive talent or active talent, all of this can be compiled into a customized pitch uh, that then you can start pitching exclusive or retained because you don't want to just have contingency recruitment all the time. You can go exclusive retained, mm -hmm. which I think goes more into once you had like 20, 40K months as opposed yeah. to zero to 10K months, you just want clients. So you yeah. just, whether it's 10% you're agreeing or 12 or 15, mm. don't be like stuck on this 15, 17%, like try and get some clients because then you can get CV sent, you can get um, momentum. So one of the, th the things that starter phase people fail with is because um, they're doing things that aren't really moving the needle. You just need to be a recruiter and get active roles. So whether you're getting them at a lower fee just to start off with, it's good because you've got the cycle of being back, of speaking to candidates, sending CVs, doing interview feedback, getting close to doing a deal. Because once you get one placement, then you get another, then you get more confidence, then you can start increasing your fees and getting better clients. And that's normally the better way as opposed to just trying to stick to try and get the perfect client each time that's going to yeah. work with you because they've retained from day one. They're not going to do that. Uh, you need to build the foundations first and just start getting momentum and, and start getting interviews and, and making placements so you can start consistently get to 10K months. So just obviously covers a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> so what the only thing that I just want is that I just wanted to focus on for a sec is the, the, the element that you're talking about, the email. Right, so the client acquisition piece and that, yep. the cold email just keep going out, that's like foundational for you. So look, you clearly are like proper in the in the trenches here, like helping people with this a lot. You, you're you going to see a lot of different campaigns. But just, just to focus on that for a sec, to make it really straightforward for people listening, like what are, what are you often like leading with on that side of things? Because I can't imagine it being like candidate CVs and these types of things. Like how are you... Yeah, how are you approaching that, right? What What's the ask? What are you, are you just trying to get a reply and just say, like, I specialize in this. Like, would it be a bad idea to connect? I don't know. Like, what is it that yeah. you're trying to, you know? So so once you've got the list, you can call email forever. So, mm. like, it doesn't cost anything to send an email. And I think people run a campaign and say it doesn't work and then they don't do another one. So what we try to do is, is batch it each quarter. So every 90 days you run a new campaign. Mm -hmm. So the first campaign might be NPC. You never touch a, I mean... The simple things are never put attachment on, mm. don't put a blue hyperlink, don't really put a signature. Like you want to just have black and white text and just look like it's a, you want to look like it's not a cold email, yeah? Mm. Even if it is a cold email, you'll still get replies because it's just all about timing. You're just trying to find the hiring manager that their best employee or whatever job title have just handed a notice in yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, you suddenly call them at the top of the inbox and you've you presented like your own agency, yeah? Mm. I mean, there's plenty of times we've won clients over the years that just ignored every single cold email and all of a sudden, year three, they came back. James, I know you keep pestering me with mm. emails. Like, I need your help on this role. So it's just all about timing and just being consistent. So that's just running in the background. Now, obviously you test different uh, outreach methods, whether it's MPC, you might be a value in terms of a salary survey guide. It might be uh, a video, it might be uh, a tech event, it might be... Um, 
diff- a variety of different like email outreach. Like there's there's plenty of different ways you can test, but I think it's you can make marginal gains on researching and, and testing copy. I mean, for example, we have a full time copywriter that's in our program that will critique your cold email outreach campaign for mm-hmm. your niche. So every niche is slightly different. Um, there might be different keywords that you might use in that email outreach. Um, so obviously we, we customize every single one. You've got the beauty now of ChatGPT. So you can create all sorts of email copy using ChatGPT. Um, mm-hmm. Once you start feeding in, you have like an SOP doc of like how you'd feed in and, and teach at ChatGPT about your industry and what you're doing and, and other email copies that you've done before. Uh, and then you can just keep creating and, and iterating it. You don't want to just fully depend on cold email. That is just something that is, I would say is a bonus. It's always running in the background, but it's up to you as a business owner to get a client. So whether that is uh, a LinkedIn outreach message, meeting them at an event, doing a video outreach, sending the letter, you just want to have lots of different uh, funnels, as it were, of like a way of how you would attract a mm-hmm. client coming into you. So it's not, yeah, so, okay. So it just sounds like there, it, you are literally leading with like, hey, I do this, like, like would you be yeah would you mind if i send something over or like you because obviously at that stage you're trying to get a reply right you just want to get a reply yeah okay okay right so that because i feel like i just want to make sure that that's straightforward for people to because the reality of it is how many people listen to this at this stage have that consistently going like the reality of it is a lot of people don't like they don't because they've either tried it they say it doesn't work or they're they're not consistent with it yeah so Mm. um again like a lot of information is out there for free, but it's it's, it's implementation and consistent, consistency. Um, mm. So you want to just make sure that's set up and, and built and running. Uh, you'd be very surprised as many agencies we have that come in uh, to work with us that have been going 10 years and haven't got that. Oh, oh yeah, I tried that four years ago. It didn't work. We, we still do cold calling or mm. outreach. You just want to make sure that you're trying different touch points and different um different channels. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you've got a a cold email channel, a LinkedIn automation channel, a video outreach channel, Mm. a live leads channel, uh, Dream 100, like all of these different pillars, you want to make sure that you've got built in the business, they're systemized, there's a process for them, and they can be handed off to uh, either your virtual team or one team member. And then the next thing I want us to focus on then, tell me about this working your job 10 steps, what's that? Yeah, is exactly what it says. So like, again, people are surprised that uh, when you be a recruiter, then you start your agency, you forget a lot of the fundamentals that you did in order to even just to work a job, for example. Um, like we just have a 10 step process of making, it's like pretty much a checklist of like every single thing like you do when you get a live job in, mm. you want to SOP it. So it's like, have we done a LinkedIn search, job board search? Have we done in mills? Have we done video outreach? Have we done voice note follow up? Have the sources started doing that? Uh, have we asked for referrals, joined groups, events like, and then, uh, done the advert, done job of the day advert, done the post, done the social post, um, each step, and then it turns and repeats. So once you've done that 10 steps, you can check it off on whether it's the Trello board you use or your sheet. Um, you know that that job's pretty much 70 to 80% worked. Because right. once you've done the 10 steps, there's not much more you can do. Mm-hmm. As we all know, as good recruiters, uh, yes, you can headhunt, you can keep cold calling, asking for referrals, but there's there's probably 10 steps. And once you've done them, 80% of that job is covered off. The rest of it, they might come back on, on an advert, they might come back off an in mail, they might come back off a video that you've done a week ago, but the majority of the work's done. Now, on most recruitment agencies, people are still doing some of the steps and then redoing them, and they don't know where they are with that. So, mm. like, once you get a volume of jobs, you want to be able to manage 10, 15 jobs. The only way you can do that is have a clear checklist of each job and what's been done at each stage. So it's more like systemizing it, a bit, again, like a McDonald's franchise, mm. as, as Michael Gerber talks about in the Emoth Revisited book. Uh, we want to have a step-by-step process for that. Okay, that makes sense. Again, probably something that people know they should do, but they haven't got. Mm. And like you said, it's that enables people to walk away from the live job and go, I've worked that onto the next, right? Because yeah. like you said, I can maybe find myself working it for a bit. I get some bites, don't get some bites, and then you go back to it, and then you're going over the same ground. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying there is, yeah, have like a clear step process of like, these are the each steps that you do once you've done them onto the next. And then like you said, you then might have a system around going through those steps again to make sure everything's covered. So before we move on to the 10K to 30K then, you've got here hire first VA. Like I speak to a lot of yeah. independent founders that don't have a, a VA. So that seems quite, you know, fundamental when we then go on to like the later stages. So talk like what should this first VA be doing? Is it elements of, like you said, if over if I um, 
uh, audit my time and activities yeah. over like the last month or last week and I'm like, right, okay, I spent two hours putting this LinkedIn job ad up or I spent three hours replying to people on LinkedIn or whatever. What should this first VA be doing in, in your view at this stage? Yeah, good question. It's a first form of leverage. I did this when I first started my business. I hired a VA in the Philippines nine years ago now. Mm. It was the best hire I did. And uh, people's mindset of uh, being a recruiter or agency owner when you're zero to 10K, is you've only got, like I said, 40, 50 units of time per week. So you're trying to be a recruiter and start your own agency and run a business and do everything. So, you, And what you end up doing, you get distracted going the full end of the spectrum. Forget about the fundamentals of being a recruiter. Um, so you need to buy back 20 hours a week of your time mm -hmm. in order to like at least scale your business. So to do that, like there's low income generating tasks. So we want to just eliminate them. So whether it's like respond to certain emails, uh, your calendar, uh, building in your CRM, responding on LinkedIn. Like there's so many things in your activity uh, inventory that you can start to delegate, but you can't do it overnight. It's step-by-step. -step. Systemized process is a uh, Loom video about it. Is there a step-by-step -step Google doc? Can you hand that off to the VA? Um, and then you'll be surprised like in your weeks that you spend your time when you allocate of like what you've done every hour mm. of the day. Um, a lot of that time is like 10 to $20 an hour tasks that you should not be doing. Mm -hmm. There's a great book on this called, uh, by uh, Dan Martell called Buy Back Your Time. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend it. Um, some of the fundamentals we've been teaching in our programs for a long time, but Dan covers it very, very well. Even when you're breaking down, say, if you're earning 100K a year, like your first uh, zero mm -hmm. to 10K, like your time per hour, uh, like 40 hours a week, everything below, I think it'll work on 30 pounds an hour or mm -hmm. whatever. Anything below that, you should be getting a VA to do that because mm -hmm. you need to be training your mind. As a business owner, you need leverage and uh, you need to be hiring that VA from day one to start buying back your time. And and then that goes on when you build out your marketing sourcing team, your delivery team, uh, your executive assistant eventually as well, which will graduate from a VA. Um, it's one of the first hires that you do before you hire a, rec a recruiter, which is, again, the biggest mm. mistake people make is hire a 360 recruiter to come and work for them, get stress burnt out, they hire, hire them for 30, 40K salary, and they've got no jobs to give them or anything else. Mm. Uh, so you don't attract A players anyway because they're not going to come and work for a startup founder as opposed to uh, an established ag agency. So the, the, the main thing to buy back your time so you can make more placements to get more money so then buy more systems, buy more people, buy mm. more time back is uh, a VA for four or five dollars an hour. Whilst we take a short break, I wanted to take a moment to chat to you about one of our amazing partners, Sourcewell, the industry leading recruitment engagement platform. I'm a user myself and I don't know what I would do without it. From building personalized messaging cadences across a variety of channels to automating follow-ups and data tracking straight back into my CRM. It's really made an impact in streamlining my workflow and most importantly, accelerating my sales results. My favorite feature by far is the live feed. By being able to see in real time who's engaging with your campaigns, it enables me to prioritize my outreach with the most engaged prospects, which helps me get way more out of what I put in. So I'm gonna be honest, if you haven't got Sourcewell and you're a recruiter, I really believe you're at a disadvantage. To find out more and see the platform in action, make sure you click the link in the show notes and mention the Recruitment Mentors podcast. Because you listen to this podcast, you're gonna be able to get access to an exclusive offer. Free 50 phone credits, 50 email credits, which is at the value of circa 500 pounds per user. So make sure you mention the Recruitment Mentors podcast and click the link in the show notes. So can, can we just can we just walk through this really quickly and then we'll move on, just to make this like really easy for people, because yeah. I've, I'm a huge advocate for this as well. And I feel like, Pete, and I'm sure you've seen this time and time again, people just like overcomplicate it or are like worried about certain things. But like my experience has been pretty much what you're saying. So like my experience has been, I recognized things that I was doing repeatedly, which were low leverage tasks that I mm -hmm. shouldn't be doing, which isn't like a good use of my time. Then what I did was then document like what I, like how I did the task. Then I recorded a short video of like me talking through the task and then I gave that to a VA which I found on Upwork. So just talk me through, just to make it really easy for people, like what, what you teach here. So if I'm a recruitment founder right now, I don't have a VA, I'm feeling stressed out, I'm doing so many different things. I've done the audit and let's just say like managing my LinkedIn inbox, mm -hmm. let's just say is the task that I wanna delegate and is one of those things that is below like 30 pound or whatever. Just talk me through how I go from there to having someone do that. 
Yeah. So the first thing, like especially LinkedIn, uh, you need a little bit more too. So we we build like a, a we call it a candidate response sheet. So okay. that means that in their LinkedIn, let's say eighty percent is going to be candidate replies, twenty percent might be client replies. Mm -hmm. So you need to create a candidate response sheet of if a, a candidate replies this, we send X mm -hmm. back. Now the great thing is with ChatGPT now is. A VA in the Philippines can put in what the reply was and a story of like, I'm a recruiter, mm. I specialize in this market, uh, I'm working this job at the moment with this criteria, um, I've sent this message, and this is a reply, what should I reply back? So back when I first started, uh, I would have to explain to the VA, like, these are the type of responses that you need to respond uh, in Slack, and then they were put in, in a Google Sheet, uh, which is a, a candidate response framework, um, because pretty much you've got it at three buckets, like, it's, it's a yes reply, it's a maybe reply, I need more information, I know I'm not interested. So most of the replies on LinkedIn are going to be that. Mm -hmm. So it's just t teaching the VA what to reply when it comes into one of those buckets. So that's the first thing I would do, is, is create an SOP uh, candidate response sheet, and I would uh, tie that to ChatGPT. So uh, we, we train our VAs on how to use ChatGPT. Like it's the first thing that they, mm. they, they do. Um, and that's the first thing that you can outsource. I mean, going all the way, like when we, we discussed maybe 40K agencies and above is, uh, we place like operations integrator VAs. These are people that uh, are very trained on Zapier, Clay, Automation, Stripify, instantly mm. that can handle everything, mm -hmm. um, all for $1,000 a month. Mm. Like, and that's, pretty much buying back your time tenfold. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, step by step, exactly how you said, documented video, Google Doc, uh, review it with them on a Zoom. Um, and then it just, most agency founders haven't got the time to tell them what to do and get frustrated because uh, they're not clear yet. So you need to be passionate about building systems. And it, it comes back to the first principles, like what, are the, what is the business you want to create? Because mm. You can create systems and automation and a bit of a virtual team and then obviously have a in-person team or you might just cut straight to an in-person and office team, but you're going to have big overheads, big risk mm. and big uh, not as get as much leverage at the start. So there is going to be a trade-off between, yes, I'm going to invest this 10 hours now training this VA every week for the next four weeks, but it's SOP'd and then it's clear and then I've bought back my time. Mm. But you're going to have to invest more time initially to then get the time back. And then where do you find this person? Fiverr, Upwork, what's the... Deal? We don't teach... I mean, I wouldn't advise on Upwork or Fiverr because that VA is already gone, as it were. They, they're overpriced in okay. the market because they're used to working with multiple clients and they will charge too much. So we would try and find a VA that is... Um, not on Upwork or Fiverr because uh, you want someone that wants to work for you full time. That is not like um, into just making extra money and because they'll start to increase the price. Mm -hmm. So like you don't search for a recruitment VA on Fiverr Upwork. That's a lot of mistakes people make because- So how do you find these people price. Then? Uh We would use um, onlinejobs.ph, for example, like okay. as a Philippine uh, VA one. Um, something like that, like Filipino job boards uh, works well. Um, we outsource a lot now uh, more in South African markets. So, mm. I mean, I've got a team of 12 out there. Um, and how do you find people that there? Is there a job board sort of thing again? Or? Yeah, I mean, we've got a full in-house recruitment team now. So we've got uh, a team that hires more people from there. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we go through a process, typical hire of like, how you would, like a LinkedIn, like a LinkedIn job, an Indeed job. Uh, we have an application funnel that will go through a few questions. Mm. Uh, they have to do a Loom video. Uh, and then they'll go through an interview process with the mm. team, uh, and then we would onboard them with everything. So okay, fair. Yeah. My just to share my experience for anyone listening, yeah, would be like my approach always a bit like what you're saying is my approach with anyone on Upwork and Fiverr. I have a VA who I've had over two years now, who's actually UK based. I wanted that personally. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm paying more for that. Yeah. And I've also got a video editor uh, who does all the podcast stuff, who's in Australia. Again, worked with him for over two years, but I met both of them on Unwork and Fiverr. Mm -hmm. But the intention was I wanted to get them off you that. You take them off, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's just my experience of like, you can also, you might shortcut this to what you just said. You might pay a bit more, but then if you want this consistently, then it's in their interest to get consistent work. So I've then jumped on the Zoom yeah. with them, qualified them, and been like, I want someone to work me consistently. So how are you gonna feel about that? Is that something you wanna do? And then they're more interested, but I get I get your point. But okay, so like if you if you're listening to this, like you have to do that in my opinion. And mm -hmm. all I would add to what you just said is if you still have ambitions to hire people, the way that I look at about it in my business now, because I've done that upfront work. Firstly, when you do that upfront work and you've got that system documented, that work's done. 
So like the ne- if that VA doesn't work out, you can give that to the next person, right? The next VA that you try if it yeah, doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I mean the ideal scenario, which is uh, what I always recommend, is hire two. Okay. Um, so uh, we would hire we build out like uh, sources, but I would hire two because one's going to work out, one's not, mm. and if two work out, double bonus. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at least you're not training them up again. So uh, for the the price of your time per hour, it's mm. better to hire two people, $5 an hour, that's $10 an hour. Mm. It's still way below your hourly rate. Mm-hmm. And you've got two assets and um, the likelihood of at least one working out is very, very high. You've still got a likelihood that two would work out. And if one doesn't work out, you've saved a lot of time by not having to onboard yeah. another one. Because then, that's what the mistake people make. And they're like, oh, I need to go and hire again. again. Fair, okay. And then the bit that I would just add to what you just said, which I found beneficial is that by doing that, if you then hire full-time employees, they can leverage that person as well. That's the thing as well. So yeah. then if you do all these systems, you hire someone that's like, well, actually, all of this, you know, the low activity stuff you won't be doing because I've got exactly. a system for that. So you could, that also that's actually becomes a selling talent. point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the other benefit. Okay. So 10K to 30K then. So five. So five. you know, I've now hired my first VA. I've really understood. I've built out this activity inventory delegation. I've got my client map. I've got my client acquisition system going. I've got the foundational stuff. Why don't we just start, like, what is typically stopping your um, agency clients consistently hitting 30K months? Like, what is it that they're maybe struggling with? You've put on here on your education stuff, business issues at this stage, hiring employees, hiring ops management, working in, not on the business, productizing services, exclusivity with clients. So yeah. what what's stopping me from consistently hitting 30K months? Yeah, so again, like it's uh, hiring a good recruited delivery consultant to, to replace you. So you, again, you need to decide, is it a lifestyle solopreneur agency that you want to do, which means that you're always going to be the recruiter, which means you're always going to speak to candidates and make placements, mm-hmm. or you're actually going to build an agency. So this is the the, the, the cross, crossing uh, chasm that uh, a lot of people struggle with is um, setting the intention of what they want. There's nothing wrong with keeping it at 30K months and just being a solopreneur, like with a couple of years, a couple of sources, you make 300K a year and uh, have some freedom, etc. cetera. Um, but then the hard part is hiring a delivery consultant. Now, let's go down the other, that's yeah. what, when we're talking here, let's go down the other route. So I feel like a lot of people, yeah, so yep. people that may not want a huge agency, but they want to be doing seven figures and however you structure that, but yeah, not not the one that you just said, the other one. Yeah, I mean, I don't advocate having a huge agency. I always say, maximum 12 to 30 yeah, employees yeah. Is, is always the cutoff, yeah? Mm. So uh, going from solopreneur to like uh, boutique agency phase, like mm. three to five remote employees, um, the first thing you need to do once you've done that is uh, you need a consistent way of, once you've managed to know how to get client leads in and convert them, you need to start getting them exclusive retained. So it's like getting more platinum clients, which means that it's repeat business. So you're mm-hmm. not having to go out and win new business all of the time. Once you win one client, that could feed you five or 10 roles a year. So mm-hmm. it could be like a 50, 100K a year account. Because then again, you know, only need three or five of them for it to be very profitable. Um, and then to attract a delivery consultant, which is what we call like maybe a 180 recruiter, that type of thing, you need a solid uh, sourcing system. So uh, one thing that I uh, advocate on is building out a marketing sourcing team. So these are uh, people that would reach out uh, to candidates on LinkedIn, uh, whether it's a, like a LinkedIn selfie video, a Loom video outreach, a voice note follow up, uh, messaging, emails. Uh, the sourcer is the one that's going to reach out and do a lot of the legwork of the sourcing. Because when you're trying to buy back your time, you'll realize 20 to 30 hours of your week is trying to find candidates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once you got the client, it just the rest of the time is searching on LinkedIn, job mm. boards, like trying to speak to candidates and get them. What, well, so, they're sending it from their profile or someone in the team's no, profile? their profile. So their like profile. They're, they're gonna be, um, yeah, like, like I said, I mean, we, we build them out in uh, South Africa and um, we've got a full service for that where we'll mm. hire, train and manage them for you. But like, they're, they're the ones that are gonna do all the outreach. So they're the ones that are gonna connect with the candidate on LinkedIn. They're gonna do all of the message follow-ups, uh, the video follow-ups, et cetera. And they're getting um, in, them interested in a specific job. You're just yeah. building talent pools. Or well, both. Like, like both. that's the thing. You create an omnipresent. So I see it as buying paid advertising. So I've spent millions on paid mm. advertising. As people are probably annoyed with a lot of my ads. Mm. And uh, apologies for that. Some Sometimes, sometimes they can't uh, stop the algorithm of like showing it so many times. But um, 
you want to create a, an omnipresence in your market, your niche. So for us, like software engineers, uh, every software engineer knew who our agency Ronald James was because mm. uh, our sources are reaching out with them with a nice vibrant video mm. uh, and the personal touch. Because at, at that point, if they watch that video, that candidate's going to come back at some stage. And which agency are they going to come back with? The one that was like with a highly vibrant video mm. from Lucy, for example, mm -hmm. that uh, took the time out of her day to message me. Like it's not going to be another recruiter that just sent a DM or an in mm -hmm. So imagine all of those touch points in your candidate market that you're penetrating over mm -hmm. a long period of time. I see that as paid advertising. And I'm, if I'm only paying $1,000 or £1,000 a month for that saucer, um, or fifteen hundred pounds a month, that that's worth it because I only need one placement every three months for that to be still very profitable. Mm. Um, and a lot of the sources that we get up to speed now can help source an extra two or three deals per month, which and could be an extra twenty k. So how do they? So how do they? How do they help the delivery person? And are you saying like they do a lot of that legwork, yeah. and then are they getting them to By, the point where they're like, I'm happy to have a conversation, and then what they correct. pass it over to? Yeah. So a bit like what we did in the first stage of buying back the agency owner's time. Now we're buying back the recruiter's time. Mm. So for you to attract a good delivery consultant, you need to attract them from a recruiter that is they might be already doing one or two deals a month. And I'm saying, well, come here, you can do three to four deals a month and you're going to get a sourcer and a VA and automation and I'm going to give you exclusive retained clients. That's going to be a lot better offer for, mm. to, for you to attract good talent, not mm -hmm. just a recruiter that you know isn't very good and is going to come in, you're going to pay them a big basic and they're not going to do anything. Um, so the whole point of a recruiter, a delivery consultant, is to buy back their time so they can focus on what we call high income generating tasks for their job which their skill is, which is very hard to replace, is speaking to a highly qualified candidate, persuading them to go to an interview mm -hmm. and persuading them to take a job. Um, I, uh, we all know we're in recruitment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the highest form of sales. Like It's mm -hmm. like the top of the top psychology in terms of like dealing with people's emotions. And how do you typically like SOP that then? Is it like I what I book in a calendar with the delivery consultant? Is it like a jump on a video call? Yeah. What's the typical, what, yeah, what's the system there then? So we, we run two models. So you can run a hybrid model in the office. So I've got actual sources in the office and I've got sources that are remote. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with all the agency owners we help, a lot of them are remote. They, they work with that recruiter uh, in tangent in Slack. So they're speaking to them every day. Uh, right. They're working jobs with them every day. They're saying, what about John for this role? What about Sarah mm -hmm. for this role? Um, right, I've got uh, Sarah available for two o'clock call. Can you take a tissue? Type, mm -hmm. type of thing. So that SOP is like, um, we have a full academy for this where we'll train the source up for six months of like how they do video outreach, how they source candidates. And like you're building in that asset, asset where that sourcer can then go into being a full-time marketing expert in your business. They can be a full-time recruiter in the business. Mm. We've had many sources do that. There's a lot of different ways that they could be your full executive assistant, for example. They could build out the full marketing sourcing team. Uh, so buying that time back is, again, like from uh, 10 to 30K months, it's like building a sourcing team. Because mm. if you can start buying back the time for a recruiter to come in, then you can attract a good recruiter and then they can do more deals profitably quicker. Mm -hmm. rather than trying to do everything when they come in from day one. And like just quickly on that then, where where do people, where where are often like the common pain points around getting this right then? I can imagine, is it challenging to get really good at like briefing, like this sourcing team or like the quality of like the candidates they're pulling through maybe can take a bit of time, bit of work. Mm -hmm. Where Where's the often like pain where maybe people might give up on really trying to make it work? Um, well, one, you need to know how to hire the sources, for example, mm. uh, attract them, uh, get a good pay model in of like how they would, would work. Um, what and, do you do? Incentivize them on the number of profiles? Yeah. yeah. So we have like a, a unique system of like how we would pay them, but like it would be a flat base of between 800 to a thousand pounds a month. And then they would get like, uh, you can do it where you would pay per, uh, uh, call booked or CB sent and interview ordeal. So you could right. go all the way up to the spectrum. Um, so we'd like to, for instance, they might source two deals in a month, they might get paid 2,000 pounds, for example. Right. Um, and then, yeah, it's just making sure you as an agency owner as onboarding them correctly and that recruiter is is like being their buddy, as it were. Like, mm. I mean, back in the day, many years ago, we used to, I think some of the top billers used to get a resourcer. Now and again, yeah, yeah. But it was a luxury, yeah? Well, that still happens. Yeah, and it, and it should have happened a lot more. I think it's just a lot of businesses didn't do that. And... Uh, I mean, looking back over my time, like I, when I we used to be a recruiter many years ago, was uh, if if I'd had like these VAs or sources mm. working for me, I would have built even way more for the business. So mm. it is highly profitable, 
Um, but yeah, the, like the biggest thing is making sure that you're you're training them and you're giving them the industry knowledge and you're explaining what is a good candidate, what is a not a good candidate, who the top companies are to mm. attract that talent from. All of the type of knowledge you would give someone sitting next to you on a desk you. shadowing you, yeah. you would do via Zoom and Loom and uh, Slack. Okay, yeah. So yeah. over-communicate. Okay, got that. So, okay, so let's say I'm at this stage. I've really got my uh, marketing and sourcing team going. Um, so if I'm um, in this stage and between 10 and 30k months as the agency owner then should I be spending most of my time trying to attract companies in their stream 100 and you know having as many presentations as possible to go through the client signature service pitch deck and the main thing that I get from what you're telling me is with the having a pitch deck and a service, um, the way that you approach it is you're selling um, how you do, how you do it, not what you do, right? So like you just said, you're breaking down like this is how we work and this is what this is actually what we would do for you, which is different, right? So you're going through, like we don't just say, James, let's work together, we worked 15%. Mm -hmm. You're saying you're going through a whole sales process where you're like, if we were to work together, this mm -hmm. is what we would do yeah. um, and how we would fill your job, right? Using all these tools, mm -hmm. um, using our resources in, et cetera, et cetera. So is that what I should be spending most of my time then at that stage to consistently be hitting pitching 30K it. months pitching and taking clients through that mm -hmm. journey? So, so trying to work more on the business. So I would be obsessed with systems, marketing, automation, uh, and then just dealing with clients. So like that's the, the key thing I would be doing from 30K months is uh, I used to target myself like always doing three pitches a week. I knew if I did three pitches, two out of three would convert or three out of three. Mm -hmm. Uh, one client might give me one job, one client give me five jobs, one might give me seven jobs. Mm. So I know I'm feeding the team. And then that's like feeding the cycle and then all of the the ten set process, the saucer and the recruiter all there. And then I'm just watching, making sure that we're getting the right amount of interviews and, and making placements. So th that's probably the hardest stage is, is going from like the 30K months to then breaking through is because uh, you, you're trying to hire your first or two, three employees. And that's why I always think it's built. It's good to start with the sourcing team that you can get maybe two or three sources and then one recruiter. Then get the delivery. Yeah, because you might still be doing 50% of the placements. Traditionally, mm. what I've seen with the hundreds of agencies we work with, they're still doing some uh, most of the placements. Right, um, at that stage. At that stage, yeah. And then like the whole idea is you need at least probably two delivery consultants to at least so you can start to step away right. uh, from doing the recruitment side. Because I, I don't think many agency owners really in their heart wants to just still speak to candidates and send CVs and, mm. and do their own placements. They mm -hmm. want to be, because you, you touched on it before, they're not a business owner. Like mm. you're not a real business owner. You just got a high paying job that mm. you've got handcuffed to because mm -hmm. it means you can't step away from the business. You know, a business isn't running without you. So at this stage, for me to break through that photo K mark, I need to be obsessed with what systems do I now have in my business, the marketing sourcing team. Mm -hmm. Like what, yeah, like in terms of uh, systems automation around how can I get to the point where three times a week I'm in front of like our ideal client talking about our service, how we can work on an exclusive basis, getting a number of jobs and then getting to the point where then you're hiring one or two delivery consultants. Mm -hmm. Just you doing clients. That's the last thing I would ever delegate. Mm. You don't automate that. You automate the outreach to get to the mm. conversation. But it was the last thing I handed off in my agency after five years was... Uh, I was always still dealing with the client side because I enjoyed that as well. So yeah. you need to be the one that's out there meeting clients in person, going to events, going to entrepreneur events, going to the networking events, sponsoring the events, hosting mm. events, uh, doing the Dream influence. 100. Key person well, that's, of that's influence, thing, Daniel Priestley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. I was I was that till the end. That's what we need to be doing as a business owner. So the first thing you want to try and hand off is eventually like the, the, the recruitment side in terms of doing the sourcing. And then once you've done the sourcing, hand off the deal side and, and bring in a consultant and give them the 15, 20% commission, 25%, mm. whatever it is that you need. So then you can free your time up so you can just get bigger and better clients that are more exclusive retained. Mm -hmm. And then, because I'm sure you've thought about this and seen a lot of this, what does a good financial incentive look like for these delivery consultants? What have you seen work well there, right? Because if you're normally people that bring on the clients and like do that element, they often always get paid the most, and that that's you, the agency owner. But like, how, like, what does the financial incentive look like? Because you've got these sources that are being financially incentivized. So you've got yep. stuff there. Like, what what have you found work to be effective there? Because we want these delivery consultants to be financially incentivized. What have you found work? Is it like a typical method of like, depending on what the fee is, they get a percentage. I don't know. How have you typically done mm -hmm. it? Because oftentimes it can be weighted mainly towards 
James who's brought on the client, right? You might get 80% of the fee and then the delivery consultant gets 20%, for example. Mm. What have you typically found to be effective then on the financial incentive side? Yeah, I mean, personally, what works well is uh, we'll do like a 70-30 split, which is um, 30% goes to house account management. So let's mm-hmm. say it's a, a 10K deal, really £10,000 deal. Uh, 30% of that goes to management because they brought the client on board and uh, they looked after the clients because because eventually as you scale, you're going to have, if you're replacing yourself, so like my team, um, there needs to be an account manager that looks after the clients mm-hmm. and they're going to need incentivized. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So you'll come up with a problem if you just suddenly start giving 20% of the recruiter and nothing, then you, you won't be able to hand off the account management side of the key clients. Mm. So you want to have a 70-30 split, which is to say, so it's a £10,000 deal, £3,000 goes to house or the client, uh, whoever's dealing with that client. £7,000 is, is commission, and then we will give 20% uh, commission on the uh, £7,000, for example. Right, got you. That's and then we'll still pay the sourcer. Because Whatever the sourcer's the out, uh, outsourced in a different country, it's, it's low fee, so I don't mind giving away. It's another £200 or £250. Pounds. That's a lot to them. It's a lot to them, yeah. Okay, cool. So in terms of like getting to this next stage then, so in terms of what have you found to be, if I'm leaning towards I want to be doing seven figures for me to break into this 40K to 100K a month, as I'm going into that, what does my, just to wrap that up, what does my team probably look like then? Is it like me, the agency owner, probably two delivery consultants and then like a marketing sourcing team with what, two, three people? Mm-hmm. So uh, you want to have an ops integrated VA for sure because they're the ones handling all the tech because like for you to get as much leverage. 10K, 30K, so to buy in 10K to 40, 30K or 40, the next yeah. stage? Uh, I would still be having that at 10 to 30K for okay. sure. Sorry, it's I like a, it's a thousand. Oh yeah, you put hiring million. ops yeah, management, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you want to be having an ops fee because, again, you, you don't want to be going on your website or fixing a LinkedIn automation or an email campaign or a mm. Zapier link that's broken inside mm. of Slack. Once you start systemizing a 10 to 30K, you want an ops fee that runs it. Uh, two or three marketing sources. Again, like that team of four is going to cost you like 3,000 pounds. Mm. It's like the cost of one salary in the UK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then a delivery consultant. Uh, and then as you go from 40 to 100, um, yeah, you can you can start to build that out. Okay, cool. um, so uh, you were talking about uh, when you get a Ford. Yeah, so like the team then that you just said, sorry, the bit yeah. that I was missing was it would be agency owner, mm-hmm. maybe one or two delivery consultants, and then like three or four marketing sources, but then also like a ops VA person. Yeah. And if you have that all working really nicely, you'd be confident that you should be consistently doing 30K a month. Yeah, like, I mean, you can do it with less. It depends on your average fee. Like, I'm basing average fees off the, I would say, the industry average from what I've seen is like £10,000, mm. 8000 to £10,000. Mm-hmm. So that's like three deals, yeah? Mm. So uh, three deals can be done with one consultant, really, mm. uh, and probably two marketing sources you could do that with. I mean, there's there's definitely people in our program that would do 500 k uh, a year with two marketing sources and ops VA. Uh, and then they're doing the deals themselves, right. or then they, then they might have two delivery consultants. Okay, fair, right, cool, got yeah. you. We'll get back to the episode in just one minute, but today I'm excited to talk to you about one of our partners, Firefish, the recruitment CRM that accelerates data-driven growth. The problem with most recruitment CRMs is that they are just a database of records meaning they become just one of the many tools that recruiters use every day. Like with all systems, the records are only as good as the data being captured. Our sponsors Firefish know that for agencies to win faster, data needs to be at the heart of their business, making your CRM the single source of truth. With over 10,000 records created and updated every day and 85% replacements from existing candidates, Firefish enables recruiters to enrich and engage their data, equipping you with real-time insights needed to win faster. To learn more about Firefish and take advantage of an exclusive Recruitment Mentors podcast offer, make sure you click the link in the show notes and mention the Recruitment Mentors podcast when speaking to the Firefish team. So the, this next stage then, let's break this down. Let's really talk about how do we get to the point where we're doing 100K a month. So why don't we start with like challenges that you've seen and get into this. So you've you've broken it down into letting go expanding clients revenue, hiring a manager, system processes KPI again, obviously, mm-hmm. which is expected. So talk to me about here, what what are the common stumbling blocks where I've got to that point that you just said, things are working really nicely, but now my ambition, you know, from when I started this business, I wanted to get to a point where, yes, I did have more freedom, but also freedom from an earning standpoint. And like, we're doing seven figures and like, that's really profitable for me. Talk to me about that. What are some of the common issues or stumbling blocks for people getting up to that stage? Mm, people like hiring. 
as uh, I know we, we mm. spoke offline. Uh, when you're hiring humans, uh, you just can't control everything. So it, it's very hard to hire good people. Uh, mm. So like the key thing is once you've got like the good systems in place, a good way to get clients, the sourcing, like if you see, I've started to delegate chunks of like the role. So like the delivery consultant doesn't do everything. The source only does one compartment. The mm. client acquisition system can pretty much run most of it and then you're pitching. Mm-hmm. So you're keeping control of the client. Um, the ops VA is running out running all of the tech you've got your VA or executive assistant PA that's helping manage your time back once you've got these pieces in then it's like the biggest shifts are going to be hiring probably two uh, or three delivery consultants that Mm -hmm. are going to be good Uh, again it depends on type of business that you want. If you want to self-manage an agency that's going to be 10 to 11 employees, the sweet spot, um, then like what worked well for me was uh, a lot of my employees are, are mums that came back in the recruitment game that work three days a week. Uh, they come in the office or they work remote most of the time, but they'll do two or three, four or five deals in mm-hmm. a month. Uh, that worked really well for me. I've went through the stage of hiring um really good recruiters that came from S3 background. That, I mean, that was always easy. I was trying to hire them that come from that background because uh, I think the, the the training there, the art of recruitment is the best. Mm. Like how I've been trained of like uh, catching the candidate and mm. the offer close and that type of stuff. Um, it means you don't have to train that. And then obviously bolting out with systems, good jobs and sourcing, then like they're always going to do two or three deals with their eyes closed. But you, you're going to be in a position where if you're not with a, a growing agency that wants to go to 50 employees and above, uh, you need a person that I would call not an A-player recruiter, just, uh, and this is no disrespect, like my employees are amazing and, and lots of people in the program is just someone that wants uh, to come back into recruitment or in recruitment and is happy doing uh, three, four deals a month um, because they've, they've got a sourcer, they've got jobs given to them. Mm. And they've still got a skill, but like recruitment's not their life. Right. So when sometimes when I was in recruitment, it's like sixty hours a week. Mm. You suited and booted. Like recruitment is everything. Mm. Like anything outside of this recruitment agency isn't the real world. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one wants to do that anymore. So like recruiters that just want to work as a recruiter, and not set up on their own. Because mm-hmm. again, you've got the risk of if you hire someone really good, uh, an entrepreneur style recruiter. Why would they do that for you when they're just going to go and do it for themselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you want to have the the middle part where you know that someone's going to be good, loyal, um, can be good at the job, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, work for you. So it's making sure that knowing that they're happy with that uh, and they're making good money. So as long as they're making between let's say fifty k to eighty thousand a year type of thing, obviously we're more than enough, mm-hmm. but a lot of people or maybe hundred K, they're happy with that and they know that your company is not be, gonna be growing to 40, 50, 60 employees and you mm-hmm. you're promising shares and a big exit type of thing. Um yeah, that's like normally the sweet sweet spot. Okay. So in terms of like so is that when you're talking about their hiring a manager? Is that what you're talking about? Or you're just saying well, the no, types of recruiters you want in the business? Yes. Is that what you're saying? So, so the manager's really the last, last thing you need the recruiters right, right, in okay, first. Great, like, so the last thing I handed it off, obviously once you've handed the client piece off, is running the business. But um, anyone can really, like 10 to 11 employees, it doesn't really need a manager. So if you've got an executive assistant stroke PA, mm. office manager, um, and then you've got a sourcer with like a head sourcer, so like one gets promoted to head sourcer, um, then you've got two or three recruiters to manage that's pretty much it. Like that can be managed pretty much self-managed. You you're can doing choose- 100K a month. Yeah. You should, you should definitely be doing that. Because it's it's 10 deals. It's like three deals each recruiter. So it's, right. it's easily done. So just break down that team again, sorry, and then we'll just break down how we get yeah. to that point. Sorry. So three, so three delivery consultants. Yeah. You could have three sources yeah. to maybe four, depending if you want to bring an extra one in. Because w- some of the sources can turn into a delivery consultant as well. Mm. Like we've done that many times. Mm-hmm. Um an ops VA mm. and a, a general uh, VA stroke PA. Yeah, and then the agency owner. And the agency owner, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I've done that right. So three, three, six. Yeah, so that's like the team of eight or nine. Yeah, yeah. So like, okay, so let, let's break this down. And so like, what, what have, if I'm if I'm doing 100K a month and that's what my team looks like, what is it? Because you've got a few other elements here that we need to master. So you've got things like under a track, you've got Candidate Funnel 2.0, inbound marketing, marketing sourcer team, which we've spoken about. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming it's just making those more efficient, um, making like getting even more out of them. You've then got, um, yeah, dialing sourcing teams. So I'm assuming it's, yeah, just making, like improving them. You've got rock niche events, I'm assuming, talking about your strategy of how you're always being omnipresent and attracting people. You've got systemized, systemized ops, higher PAs, API automation, dialing metrics. Like, yeah, what what is it that, 
you found consistently at that stage, agency owners have got really fucking good at that has enabled them to do these 100K a month. What are the things that stand out to you? Are those things that you've broken down? Well, all of them, at some point, you need to have pretty much all of them to mm. be consistent with uh, as long it's, it's as long as you're, you know, the life bloody business is like the, the clients that are coming in. So as long as you've got good uh, platinum clients that you're looking after mm. that are giving you repeat business um, and then making sure, yeah, like things like Zapier, Clay, like all the things that you can work on optimization and optimization so you can make things a little bit more efficient. That's going to increase revenue as well. Um, and then just staying on top of making sure the team's delivering like it's just. Yeah, you're, you're just overseeing the business and you're checking core KPIs. So you have a good dashboard, a visual visual dashboard, a CEO dashboard, I call it, of like known your metrics. Of Let's like, break that down. Yeah. What does that normally look like? CEO dashboard. So typically. it'll be client leads, so outreach. So like how many have you outreached per week? Like how many client leads have come in? How many client meetings have you had? How many clients have you closed? Uh, how many live jobs have you got? What is the value of the live jobs? What's the live job uh, to CV sent ratio? What's the CV to interview ratio? What's the interview to deal ratio? Um, and then obviously you've got your standard ops costs and staffing costs and then your profit margins. So like every month you'll see, okay, I made 72% profit this mm. this month. Next month I might make 55% profit. Um, and then, so they're all the lifeblood of like, known, obviously the number one metric you look at is interviews. So like if I know my interview conversion ratio to deal is three to one or four to one, I know we've won this amount of interviews. I know we've got this amount of deals coming in this month. Mm. Uh, as long as you've got that dashboard um, and then obviously you can go and, into a lot more detail in terms of like the cash flow side of things as well but i just know that like the client leads outreach the client leads coming in the client uh meetings the conversion the live jobs is a good metric so you know like the live jobs of like if you've got 85 live jobs for ex mm. example i know we've got a healthy amount of jobs um how many have sourced or how many book calls are in mm. how many maybe even loom outreach how many video outreach how many book calls uh, how many CVs sent, how many interviews. I think most agency owners will know those type of metrics. What, um, so if I'm an agency owner at that point, I've got my CEO dashboard, what am I spending a lot of my time on then? Like, what does that typically look like? I mean, for me, I was always learning. So I'm like, uh, still like, I'm, I'm trying to look at refinements of my business of like, so we, we mentioned uh, Candidate Funnel 2.0. So I was building things on like, how can I nurture the, these developers in the Northeast? So that would be, i create like active campaign sequences uh, where we'd create touch points. So I know like every time a candidate's opened an email, they get a point score. Mm. Uh, every time they download something, uh, whether it's some value add, uh, every time they're on LinkedIn or responding, like there's things you can work on to attract candidates. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's like making sure the team's in place. Uh, you like, put a meeting with them, what does that look like? Every day, like we do a meeting in the mornings, 9.30 a.m. Uh, so we'll go through the meeting with them. Uh, like the um, three wins from yesterday and what they're looking to achieve today. Um, Not like every day. Yeah, yeah. What with the delivery, what with everyone or? Yeah. I mean, that's me, my team and my education company for the recruitment agency. Uh, my uh, business partner, Dan, uh, mm. my brother does that. Okay, yeah. cool. So in like where, okay. And then like if I'm, if I've really got this going then, what have you typically seen in terms of like, like where did the profit margin sit then? Because like this is the a big part of, mm. I feel like what you teach is like you are building a recruitment agency in a different way. You're leveraging tech, you're leveraging like resource, you're systemizing what you do so you're less reliant on. So like what have you typically found in, you know, the agencies that you work, uh, work with? Like if I'm doing, yeah, 100K a month, what does that then typically look like profit wise? Yeah, uh, generally 50 to 60 percent. Really? So, yeah, we're at 50, 60 percent. And uh, a lot of people that are in our elite mastermind that are doing 100 months is around about 50, 60 percent. The reason why it will vary, it just depends if the agency owner decides to make some placements. So, mm. like, one of the agency owners still makes, like, because he's got a 20K, 25K average fees, mm. he'll still pull in one or two himself. So he's not paying the 20 or 30% mm. commission he's paying to a recruiter, for example, mm. in his team. So, uh, yeah, typically the, the profit margins, you're looking 50 or 60%. Um, some averages, it, it, it does depend, but because we outsource a lot with the sourcing, like these are low cost, mm. um, as opposed to traditionally what it used to be is like it's all in office employees, yeah, where mm -hmm. you're paying salary, uh, national insurance, like pension, uh, all of this type of things and, and higher salaries. So you can you can get a higher profit margin. But for me, I would personally uh, 
then, I mean, the goal after that recruitment agency, everyone's thinking, well, the next level uh, for me was education and now software to get me to nine figures. Mm. But it's like, it, that means you've got a revenue producing asset business that is spent on cash every month once eventually it starts running without you that you can use to invest in property, other ventures. Uh, you might go and start software. You might invest in other companies. You might do something else as mm. an entrepreneur. Um, that's like a goal for a lot of recruitment agency owners is like they don't want to be in recruitment forever, um, mm. especially in the trenches, uh, mm. doing it forever, um, unless you're going for exit. So I don't help. Uh, that, that's not my forte in terms of like um, if you want to go and exit and go to 40, 50, 100 employees plus, um, I'm sure there's other people that are out there that are more experienced to help, but most people don't really want to do that. And it's very hard. It's a hard slog to exit the company, uh, recruitment agency. Um, I think the stats on 95% of businesses don't sell. So um, the sweet spot is like have it as a revenue producing asset and then go and invest in other things and keep it operating. Um, so that's why you put convert profit to wealth. Yeah. So... Why? So what I just want to get your take on then, like we've broken down a lot. I, I think there's so many things in there that would be really helpful for, for people to go through each stage. I'm sure um may have come across things online, but I feel like people definitely in our industry are really like advocating like AI and the, the, the like tech element, mm -hmm. just like not being a good thing in the sense of like, oh, I've just... Like LinkedIn just wrote this job ad for me. I used the AI function. It was terrible. Just got this outreach message. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure this is why you've mentioned, you know, tech, AI, chat GPT. But then a lot of the things that you've mentioned a lot are things like Loom, voice notes, all that. And that's the one-to-one mm -hmm. -one element, yep. right? That That's going to be, there will be obviously tools at different points where you can put things in and it generates a voice or whatever. But like, how, how are you balancing that? Because I feel like there is a balance there, right? Mm. Um, I think you'd be foolish to really lean against, like, I'm not going to use any of this because I just feel like it's going to make everything unauthentic and, like, imperson impersonalized. Yeah. But a few times you've broken down your systems, it does involve a human being mm. sending a personalized video or whatever. So, like, how, how do you talk about that balance with your clients? Because I'm sure that's something that makes people skeptical or a bit like, oh, I'm not sure this is going to work, James, or I don't want this to be the case when people receive things from me. Yeah. But you, you mentioned, obviously, the nail on the head, Hisham, with um, using automation to a point, but this, you're never going to replace the human element. So mm. uh, everything that we do with the outreach is, is still going to have a human point of contact. It's just leveraging it to get it there. Uh, but also it's using uh, AI in the right way. So um, the reason why some AI messages just don't hit is because people aren't training the AI in the right way and given the right descriptions mm. for it to not sound AI generated, for example. So I always like would use it and leverage it, but not like be fully dependent on it. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a balance between um, not automating AI everything, but for instance, like clear.com, for example, of how we build out these playbooks, these recruitment playbooks of uh, a live lead, that can be fully automated with like the full email outreach. But then you would do the email outreach, but then you would do maybe a, a customized, uh, personalized Loom video or LinkedIn video uh, to outreach with a client. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a balance, uh, but it's, Definitely, like people that take advantage of this early, like will win for sure. Mm. Um, but you don't, you're never going to automate the full process of recruitment. Uh, you're always still going to speak to candidates. You're still going to influence a candidate uh, to take a job, and you're mm -hmm. still going to influence a client to work with you, and you're still going to influence a client to make an offer to a candidate mm. and make the placement. Like these elements are always like the human contact. And then I have to ask because I feel like. Again, like your whole thing is about helping agency owners build like a different type of recruitment business. It's very marketing led, it's automation led, it's systems led. But again, I think in our industry, what what I feel like personally, if you're in a recruitment agency right now, you don't have your um, own business. Mm. One of the quickest ways you can stand out is actually by being willing to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. And look, you're you're building a software business from my from everything that I've read and learned. Um, like a big element of these um, successful SaaS companies is outbound mm -hmm. and actually picking up the phone. So like a lot of the things that you've broken down doesn't really involve from you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, on the agency owner not really doing you know cold calling sprints and these types yeah. of things like 
where does this fit in for you? You just said there, obviously, there's a personalized element, the human element. But how how do you how do you feel about like your agency owners and your clients getting good at selling and you know sell um, you know uncovering issues mm. and challenges and using outbound as a tool? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in my education company, we we use outbound. Like we have dialers, I have setters that, that dial leads. Um, but they're warm leads, but they're dial. So uh, cold calling, like it can still be an option. I mean, for me personally, like and and everyone that I've taught in the program, uh, I just had an ethos from day one when I started the agency. I will not make a cold call. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think this was like what, eight nine years ago. Everyone was like, I think because when you're in an industry where you come in to work when you used to be a recruiter and the first thing was just on the phone all the time. Mm. It still works, but it's up to you. Like it can just be, it's just another channel. Cold outbound is just another channel, mm. like email outbound, LinkedIn, video, voice note, uh, AI follow-ups, mm. like everything's just like a, a channel. So you can choose to put that in if you want. Like if you're buying back your time with everything else and you've got a two-hour slot of fire mode where you're going to do cold outbound for two hours a day, do it. But to find uh, cold outbound dollars is very hard. Like people don't want to call call. Mm. Like, like where does it fit in your business then? Uh, in our education company, we do outbound uh, dialing. So, but I'm assuming your intention about who they're calling, right? Is it people that have opened X number of emails, replied um, to things? It, like... it would only ever be if they've uh, wanted to download a workbook or, or something right. of value for uh, that we, that we give them. Uh, then we would give them an outbound dial, um, right? And if they're interested. But again, the conversions are low. It's a numbers game. So, mm. like my outbound dialers are targeted to do 150, 200 dials a day. Um, and from that, they might have three conversa three good conversations. The right. connection rate on a cold outbound dial, you're looking at like 1% to mm. like 3% of like where you're going to get a conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need to, like, this is why when you build a business, having dialers is a different business. So it's a different culture. It's a different type of person you're hiring. Mm. Like, because not everyone wants to do it. Mm. And those people are, again, high egos or like mm. unbound hyperactive, like wanting to mm -hmm. get the things done. So you need to be in a high driven company like a Grand Cardone mm. type sales company mm. but most people don't want to create that type of business mm. so the only way to call Unbound to work really for me would be in an office mm -hmm. um, where everyone's like pumped up and everyone's mm. like uh, ready to do dialing and everyone's doing it together that's mm. the only way it's going to work with the energy but that's very uh, labor intensive and that would have to come from you as the agency owner to drill everyone to make dials that, yeah. so you'll get burnt out and you just don't want to do it anymore. So I leave that for maybe the bigger agencies and everything else. Mm. Um, or you can outsource it uh, or you can add it in. It's fine. Like it's uh, it's not a big thing. It's not against um, against called outbound. It's, mm. uh, we use it in one of our companies. But um, again, it's just a channel. Because that's the thing. Like when you think about what, from your perspective, a 100K a month recruitment business looks like, you haven't got like 360 recruiters in there. No. Never would. I just, I just don't believe in it. Yeah. Like it's so flawed. It's beyond doubt. Mm. Like everything I've learned to get to ten million plus now in in my life is mm. like leverage and keeping things simple mm. and focus on the few, not the many. Um, get one thing right before you go on to something else. How is a three hundred and sixty recruiter going to be great at marketing? Going to be great at cold email outreach? Going to mm. be great at cold dialing? Going to be great at getting a client, pitching a client, then find then sourcing on LinkedIn, mm. then doing outreach on LinkedIn, then messaging on LinkedIn, then managing the diary, then managing their emails, mm. uh, speaking to candidates on the phone, trying to get interview feedback, organizing interviews, trying to close a deal, trying to count <laughs> off a deal, trying to make sure they're staying in rebate, trying to make sure you, like the client's paying on time. Mm. And then going back to Dream 100, then going to pitch them, going to events, going to meet them. Mm. Like, it's impossible. Like, it's that is so outdated, mm. it's beyond belief. And any good 360 recruiter wouldn't need to work for an agency, I don't think. Start on your yeah, own. At some point, You'll make way more that. money. Mm. Um, they'll come and do my course to someone else's. Like, it's mm. like they, w they wouldn't need to do that unless they're getting shares in the company in equity, which is totally fine. Mm. Um, and that's good. So there's some businesses, I used to work for one, that uh, would give you share equity and... Uh, some people have done very well out of that, but they're few and far between those type of companies. Mm. Like, I, I agree with you. I mean, my my business helps those people with those issues, yeah. right, free training and stuff. But from my point of view, it, I, I do feel like, I don't know what you think about this, but a big part of why I feel like it's going to take a long time for that model to change, like in a, in a drastic way in terms of like more companies don't have that model than do, is where they adopt some of the things that you teach, and so yeah. many people, so many agency owners don't. So they come from an ex Frank group or whatever, or even just a small agency, and they've seen mm. how it's been done. 
Exactly. And they're like, I'll just build that. Maybe I'll just hire a couple of people and then we'll make it work or whatever. Mm. So I, I do feel like a, a big part of like this. So many companies I speak to, that's that's their model. But a lot of the time they don't have anything like what we spoke about today in their business. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And they don't 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 know the other way that they don't know the alternative. Yeah, but but that comes down to not being uh, like interested in business. Like if you're mm. really interested in business and you're looking at the fundamentals of like a business, like you would start to unpack thinking this model is flawed mm. and I'm going to do things slightly different because um, people like, yeah, look, it doesn't not work, um, but it's just very, very hard and very manual. And uh, yeah, like you're not really building a moat around your agency because you're building no assets. Like you're mm. just hiring people. It's a people business. And yes, recruitment is a people business, but you can still leverage yourself a little bit more and de-risk it. Um, but yeah, a lot of people go into starting an agency just seeing what they've done before in the previous agency and think it's going to work, mm. which is why like what, uh, 70, 80% of businesses fail within five years. So Yeah, I think yeah. if you're listening to this and like, that is your business, all I would say, the smart thing to do would be what things that you shared today can I implement, right, to mm. help me get more out of my... 360 recruiters, right? Would that be the marketing sourcing team? Would that be like, do you know what I mean? Exactly. You, can, you don't need to change the, those things. Yeah, don't change the full model, but there might be one or two things you could implement that gives you a little bit more leverage exactly. and it increases profit margin and de-risks things a little bit. So mm. whether it's like having your 360 recruiters having a sourcer, having a VA, having some automation, um, as if like any one of those elements you could add in. So it doesn't mm. mean you change your model overnight, which is another thing I would never recommend is like from day one, coming in and, and suddenly changing your model like you're already used to. Mm. Like it, it'll take time. It might just be 10% element here and there that you're taking and then you start to make a little shift and you yeah. might have a hybrid model between that. So before before we round this out then, I wanted to, and this sort of a nice segue, uh, I wanted to ask a, um, a friend of mine who works in recruitment, been in an agency for 10 years, mm. has an opportunity to have equity, exit, all these types of things. He's a 360 recruiter. That's sort of what he's done really enjoys your stuff. And I was like, look, what, what would you love me to ask him? And I think this is the perfect question just to, then, to get your take on. A lot of recruiters listen to this. They work for a company and they work for a company that isn't as open to having a systemized approach, right? They're doing it because it's always worked a certain way. Mm. So like the question is, what from your perspective, what could be some of like the low hanging fruit a consultant could implement to his or her desk that they can see results from, that they've learned from this? Because we spoke yeah. about from the agency owner, right? A lot of people listen to this, might be championing their manager and owner to like, we need this product, we want to do this, but oftentimes they get shut down. So what, what would your response be to that? Or what comes to mind? Yeah, it is it is a tough one. And I, I feel for people like that um, because I was in their shoes at some point and got frustrated where I was because the, the things wouldn't change. Uh, if you're allowed, like I would leverage my time back. So I would be hiring a VA on the side mm. that is just going to delegate and do a lot of things. So like do LastPass share. It depends. I don't know what company they're in, but they might have a IP blocker on like some of like their logins for mm. certain things. But I would try to hire a VA to buy back some of my time mm. just to organize candidates. Uh, I would maybe even uh, still hire a marketing sourcer. Uh, that's going to do some video outreach and uh, voice and follow up for me for candidates and help me source some candidates and pay them. Uh, so they could pay them out on their own wages and hire them freelance for a thousand pounds a month. Um, and if they get an extra uh, candidate a month, that's an extra deal. Like that could leverage his time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it is a tricky one. Like I would just be trying to trying to buy back my time so I can double my output. Mm. So how can I get forty hours extra per week? So doing the activity inventory mm. um, and then hiring the source or a VA like would be the first thing. I don't know if you would be allowed to do automation on a LinkedIn account, but something like that. Uh, email automation um, and then leveraging ChatGPT and maybe leveraging clay.com, like mm. research app um, for some AI piece. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a tough position he's in, but um, yeah, I would start with those. No, I, f I think that's smart. Like it's not going to cost a whole lot. Yeah. You'd learn a lot, actually. I think there's also the net positive of actually learning, of actually doing that, right? Writing your systems down, outsourcing it, getting someone on board to do it. Um, I, I think that's that's where I'd probably go. Like, could you could you hire a VA out of your own money? Mm -hmm. um, could you even get to the point where you have a um, market source, as you said, resource that goes out and do, does some of the legwork or even have someone that does your market map and, and does yeah. that, like, do you know what I mean? Data building, yeah. Awesome, all right, we've covered a lot. That's cool. the journey then. So if we get to that point, um, 
you know, I, I think what what I just love about what I love about what you teach is just the systems piece. I think that's what people mm. need to take away. Like you are helping people avoid having so much chaos in their business. These people start this entrepreneurial journey because they want to do it on their own. They think they can do it better. They want their own business. Mm. But a lot of people that I speak to, um, they work in a recruitment business. They don't have a recruitment business. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, like for me, if you're listening to this, it's just about what things can I take? How can I challenge maybe the status quo of like how I've been doing things? Mm -hmm. Can I be open-minded to trying some of the things that I've learned today? And with the simple goal of can you get more of your time back and actually get more freedom back, which is probably some of the things that you thought about when you started that entrepreneurial journey, right? But it hasn't quite planned out or maybe you've had moments where things have gone well and you mm. feel like you have more freedom and then it's been challenging. So that's just what I love about this is like the system and everything that you teach. So hopefully people listening to this can get a ton of value. Yeah, hopefully. I like, Always be curious. Like you should always be wanting to learn and listen. So like um, people that are successful, like, and I've got many successful friends now in Dubai, everyone's still curious and always learning. Mm. So they're always investing in themselves, reading books, getting mentors, and always curious about how things are done. Whereas um, what I've seen in some of the recruitment world, and, and I was one of them, was like, no, no, it's done this way, and mm. you've got blinkers on. Um, for you to be successful, you need to know and, and look at different things, how are things done um, in business, and, and try and be a little bit more open-minded with uh, different uh, solutions. Try and test and, and try these things. Um, yeah, so to sort of be open. But hopefully uh, people have took a couple of things. Like I said, even if it's a 360 model, is it elements that you can implement mm. that can be systemized or or a different unique hybrid strategy that you could you could put into your own agency love it james yeah thank you thanks for having me bro <laughs>